Hello ladies and gentlemen. This is Karen Sharp again. I am here with Professor Randolph Hemmings. Today the professor will tell part one of a four-part series on the origins of the U.S. color line. Thank you Karen. This is session C7A, before the invention of the color line. The United States is unique in preserving a genetic enclave of mostly African ancestry. Other New World populations enjoy a mix of European, African, and Native American ancestry. The enclave results from the U.S. intermarriage barrier. Look at other countries. Black-white intermarriage cannot even be defined in Latin America, where everyone is mixed. And in the UK, where racial labels exist, Afro-British art marriage runs about 38%. This is 10 times the African-American art marriage rate today. In practice, the unique US horror of Euro-African intermarriage has lasted for four centuries. Today we discuss colonial life before the intermarriage barrier was invented. In 1653 Virginia, one of Anthony Johnson's involuntary African laborers, a man named John Kaser, claimed his freedom because his term of indenture had allegedly expired seven years before. He fled his master's plantation to the home of a nearby farmer. Johnson insisted that his runaway laborer was not indentured, but was a lifelong slave and he demanded the Africans return. Not wanting to get into a fight with a powerful plantation owner, the farmer turned the worker over to another wealthy planter. That planter, Robert Parker, sided with the worker, kept him on his own plantation's workforce, and argued on his behalf in court. The case dragged on for two years, with Johnson at one point agreeing to manumit Kaser, but then reneging on the settlement. In March 1655, Northampton County Court ruled that Kaser had been a slave all along, and ordered the worker to be returned immediately to Anthony Johnson. They also ordered Parker to pay damages for sheltering the runaway for two years, as well as court costs. A few years later, Robert Parker abandoned his career as a Virginia planter and returned to England. Twenty years later, Kaser was still a slave, owned by Mary Johnson, Anthony Johnson's widow. What is important about this tale is that Anthony Johnson was also African. His plantation, from whence Kaser fled, was named Angola, and it exploited European forced laborers as well as Africans. African American colonists first arrived in Virginia in August of 1619. Most came as indentured servants. Slavery, lifelong hereditary involuntary labor, had not yet been adopted in British North America. The African colonists were under no initial implication of racial inferiority. The endogamous color line had not yet been invented. Africans soon permeated all three socio-economic classes. According to contemporaries, they accumulated land, voted, testified in court, and mingled with whites on a basis of equality. Some remained indentured servants, forced to labor without pay, and without the right to quit. Forced laborers, both Afro and Euro-American, ran away together, attempted servile insurrections together, and jointly complained about both the greed of the bourgeois and the cruelty of the aristocracy. Others became artisans and shopkeepers as well as professional lawyers, physicians, or skilled farmers who contributed to colonial life. This middle class, both Afro and Euro-American, complained about the laziness and dishonesty of their forced laborers, and of taxes, imposed by rapacious aristocrats. Still others became aristocrats. Slave importing was the route to social status. In 1651, Anthony Johnson earned 250 acres for importing five slaves, we do not know their land of origin. Richard Johnson, Anthony's father, received 100 acres for importing two slaves, also of unknown origin. John Johnson, Richard's brother, did better, winning 550 acres for bringing in 11 slaves, again, we do not know how many were African or European. Benjamin Dole, also African American, received 300 acres for importing six slaves into Surrey County. All of these men owned Tidewater plantations, and left large estates. They were established members of the ruling class. Intermarriage was common. 
visitors reported that the colony swarms with mulatto children, and these mulattoes, if but three generations removed from the black father or mother, are accepted as white. Among prominent interracial marriages were those of European attorney William Green's Ted and his biracial wife Elizabeth Kay, African slave owner Francis Payne and his European wife Amy, European Francis Skipper, and his African wife Anne Cockor, African James Tate and his European wife Hester, and African Philip Mognam and his European wife Mary Morris. In 1666, about 300 of Virginia's colonists were of African ancestry, like the Johnsons. At that time, 11% of African colonists and 18% of European colonists owned land or slaves. This is analogous to a 60% ratio of black to white net worth, higher than the United States would ever see again in its history. For comparison, by 1980 the US black to white net worth ratio had fallen to 15%. By 1995 it had fallen to 12% and by 2007 it was down to 6%. It is still falling even as we speak. Let me repeat those last two points. They are important. First Afro-European intermarriage was as common in the 17th century Chesapeake colonies as in Latin America. Second, the net worth gap between white and black Americans was smaller than it would ever be again. In short, intermarriage was common, and racial inequality was virtually unknown. Then attitudes began to change. America would never be the same. Our next session will be C7B, during the invention of the color line. We shall examine the transition period, as colonists began to develop a newly invented race notion. We shall see how they began to see one another differently, not by religion or by social class, but by continent of ancestry. And, with that, I conclude today's presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Hemmings. There is one thing that I do not understand. You seem to be saying that society was very liberal in the 1600s, that inequality was unknown, and there was no prejudice nor bigotry. Oh no. I'm not saying that at all. Much to the contrary. It was a time of cruel oppression, group hatreds, and no human rights at all. The landed gentry ruthlessly exploited their slaves, and even let them starve when tobacco prices fell below profitability. Landowners were exploiters, not settlers. They produced tobacco, and forbade food production. They sold their product in Europe, and imported food with part of the proceeds. But the food ship might be late. Or tobacco's market price might be low, making it wiser to stockpile it for a few months. Then the laborers starved. Mass starvation was the 17th century's version of downsizing. Specifically, five out of six of the laborers, European and African, imported to Virginia between 1619 and 1625 died before the end of that period. Out of 5,000 imported workers, 4,500 perished within a decade of arrival. From 1607 to 1610, half died in each year that passed. Half died between 1610 and 1618. 8 out of 10 died between 1619 and 1624. Also, it was a time of bloody group hatreds, not only between Christians and heathens, but also between different Christian sects. You might be asked at any moment whether you believed that Christ was present in the Eucharist. The wrong answer would get you hanged, and the right answer changed several times during Cromwell. And the notion of human rights would have been laughed at. Indeed. Just a century earlier scholars debated whether Native Americans even had souls. No no Karen. The 17th century was far from liberal or tolerant or egalitarian. They simply had not yet invented the notion of race. Thank you professor. That was very informative. Well, that is our time for today, ladies and gentlemen. This is Karen Sharp. And Randolph Hemmings. Signing off until next time.